Uh, and then Wolin gives us other examples, like for example, Goebel says that um, uh, you know he conceives of fascism as being quite directly counterposed to the egalitarian and scientific rationalist spirit of the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution, by the way, in case you don't know, was highly rationalist and highly egalitarian in terms of what existed in Europe at the time. Do you, uh, how many of you have played uh, cards? How many of you play cards? Right? Not regularly. Have you played cards in your life? So what's the highest patta? Ace. ace. And what do you call an ace in Urdu? Yakka. And what does yakka mean? One. So actually the ace is one. If you notice your, your stack, your, your cards start from two, three, four, five, six. So where's, the, where's the one? The one is the ace. So with the French Revolution, when the ace trumps the king, trumps the, you know, everything else, that is itself a re the revolutionary message that the meek shall inherit the earth. Those who are uh, uh, the wretched of the earth, the ones will be able to cut off the head of the king, etc. Right? So the game of cards itself was rethought with the French Revolution. That shows you, you know, and, and they had lots of crazy ideas and some really fascinating ones. I thought the year should be 100 days long because what's this 365 and a quarter nonsense? <laughs> you know, let's just make it 100 days because then everything, and the time should also be like, you know, what is this 60 second rule? Yeah, why do we have 60 seconds? Why not 100 seconds? Why don't we have 100, you know, sort of minutes? Math would be so much easier, right? Uh, we, you know, uh, what do you call those, those equations where you do Speed is equal to velocity over time, uh, right? Uh, sorry, excel sorry, speed is equal to distance over time. What a mess it makes when distance is measured in, you know, uh, divisions of intervals of, you know, you, in tens, basically. And time is measured in, in, a, in, in 60s, right? So after 60, you go back to zero, zero, or you go back to one, right? It messes up the whole math. It really messes it up. That's why you get these odd numbers, etc. Do you know why this happened? Anybody? Why is it that? Why wouldn't it be better? What's your name? Vaseem. Wouldn't it be simpler if time also was, if the hour was 100 minutes and the day was 100 hours? Or 10 hours, not 100 hours. 10 hours and one minute was 100 seconds? Duration of skull prints. So you have 24 hours to division. So who made that division? Did God give it to us? That they will be from this point onwards, they will be 24 hours. <coughs> who made it? They divided the, the moment uh, sun rises to the, again the next day sun rises. They divided who divided? The time. Who? Yes. So the only reason we have 60 seconds and 60. Uh, minutes in an hour and so on and so forth. We have a what's called a base in mathematics. Oh, there was a mathematician here? Where's the mathematician? Semi-mathematician here. The base of time is 60 but the base of uh, distance is 10. Why is this discrepancy? Because the Babylonians basically took a dial, cut it in half, then cut that in half and then cut those halves into weird halves and you know sort of we got this result. Yes. Hexadecimal, yes. Um, that's the only reason. The Babylonians did it this way, so now we're stuck with it. So the French Revolution, when it occurred, some people said, yeah, the Babylonians made a mistake. We're stuck with this mistake. Why don't we fix it? Then wouldn't life have been simpler? You would have been doing math like this. Mental math would be so easy. It would be no problem. Sorry? Yeah. We should, have, we should, we should start a new movement here at Lums. People thought that was nuts. How could you have 100 days and 100 uh, minutes and so on and so forth? But that's the French Revolution for you. Lots of crazy ideas. All right. So now, that was the recap. You were so excited, I can tell, that you really don't want to take a break. You're like, sir, this is so good. Tell us more. Paris? Yeah, those people. 
uh, the workers and peasants. Yeah, workers. yeah absolutely. Isn't there a revolution regarding that? So yeah, absolutely. So the French Revolution is the revolution that raises the idea of people's power and of, you know, um, uh, rule of the general will of the people and. Oh, because the French Revolution was at the same time deeply, deeply and thoroughly rationalist in the sense they were totally opposed to the Catholic Church. I mean, completely opposed to the Catholic Church. They, and not for no reason, the Catholic Church was the, ins the institution that held that entire uh, feudal system uh, in its place. It was uh, the Catholic Church owned about a third of the agricultural land of Europe. It was itself a feudal lord, if you will. And it, was, it, it, it provided the ideological apparatus that justified the rule of feudal lords and kings and so on and so forth. It was part of the system. And it was perceived by the people as being part of the system. People were desperate, poor, and hungry. And they wanted to break this system. And also, the French Revolution had been preceded by about a uh, hundred years of some of the most fascinating new discoveries that mankind has ever made. Uh, it was preceded by what's called the scientific revolution. What was that? That was first of all Nicholas Copernicus who got up and said the earth doesn't, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. <gasps> Blasphemy! Then Galileo said not only is Copernicus right, look here, I made a door beam. It's true. <gasps> Double blasphemy. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Galileo was such a simple hearted sort of guy, he thought he'd just invite the Pope and show him. And the Pope would be like, oh, yeah, you're right. I guess the Bible means like correction. Kar dete. It's not going to happen that way, right? For 2,000 years, you've been saying one thing. It's not going to happen that you're going to change so easily. And then came along, along came Kepler, Johannes Kepler. And what did he do? Well, what he did was he took the, uh, the, uh, the um, astronomical trajectory of the planets and he showed that they, the movement of the planets could be depicted with perfect mathematical accuracy if you just accepted that the planets didn't move in a circle but moved in an eclipse, uh, sorry, an ellipse. You know, you, know, you know the difference, right? If my power would allow me. So the center would be here and the planets were moving like that. And so the time it would take for a planet to move from here to here would be the same as the time a planet would take to move from here to here. So he proved it mathematically. And he was right. He's still right. We still use the same equations to send Mr. Neil Armstrong and Yuri Gagarin up into the sky. He got it right. So when he did, I, now imagine this is triple blasphemy because a lot of people at that time believed that Jupiter was a god. Mars was the god of war. Venus was the god of love. Mercury was the great bringer, the messenger of uh, the sun, which they also believed was, you know, sort of a god, etc. So now you're telling me that these planets that we have worshipped for thousands of years are just moving around in this mathematical formula, you know, and you can tell us where they're going to be tomorrow and day after and after that, etc., etc. <gasps> you can imagine the Khadim Rizvis of Europe <laughs> saying, Aya <laughs> Ghori. <laughs> they were shocked. Why did I bring this up? All oh, right, <laughs> to answer your question. So, all of this, um, this tidal, and then you have Newton, right? Newton comes along and brings, like, he's like an earthquake. Uh, across the world uh, and uh, you know first of all he, he's a smart guy uh, so by the age of his early 20s he's around your age when he comes up with calculus he comes up with calculus you are still trying to figure out what it is right he creates it but he's such a smart cookie that he doesn't tell anyone he does not tell anyone <laughs> um, he doesn't tell it he hides it and then he uses it to, you know, to make astronomical predictions and so on. And he publishes his result, but he doesn't tell his method until Mr. Leibniz gets up and discovers calculus as well. And then he gets all angry and mad and says, oh my God, you stole that from me and so on and so forth. And they get into a huge fight. 
But Newton is like a train wreck. Why is he like a train wreck? Because he says, you know, his laws of motion, etc. And what he does is he, he shows that the reason why this is going to happen the way Kepler, uh, 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 Galileo, and Copernicus is saying that it's going to happen that way is because of, of a force that's acting to pull these two bodies together, and that is gravity. So he provides the scientific justification that then connects all the dots together and closes the circle of why you know uh, the planets move the way they did. And you might think, I can't even see the planets in Lahore because there's so much pollution. You know, uh, I can't even see the stars. Sometimes I can't even see the moon. It's pollution ho gayi hai, you know. Why do they really care about it so much? Well, number one, there was less pollution. So they could see the stars. And number two, this is one of the great mysteries that man wanted to. We always looked at this, you know, not everybody had access to the beautiful mountains of Kashmir and Nathyagali. Not everybody had access to the beautiful, you know, sandy beaches of, I don't know what. Uh, <laughs> not everybody had access to rivers and people lived in different climates. But everybody at night, when they sat down on their charpais and looked at the sky, marveled at the sights that they saw in the sky and wondered about them and created all kinds of mythologies and all kinds of stories and interesting tales about them and sometimes believed the tales that they themselves created uh, and thought that those tales came from beyond and so on and so forth. You know, uh, saw in the various constellations, they saw various animals in them. You know, uh, they saw, uh, uh, what was it, the scorpion in one, and they, they saw a crab in the other, and they saw, was there, was there a wolf as well? Really? A wolf and a taurus, a bull. What else did they see? Twins, Gemini, what else did they see? Virgo, what is Virgo? Sorry? So, you know, the, the, the horoscope that you look, uh, that you, what, are, what, are your, what are your stars? Emmett, what's your star? Cancer. So you're a crab. No wonder you're always so crabby in my class. Right? So cancer is a crab. So they saw this constellation, and for some reason, they imagined it was like a crab. What else do we have? Leo, the lion, the bear. What else? Sorry? Capricorn, Capricorn which is what? The ram or something? Goat. The goat, the ram, yes. Or? Aquarius, Aquarius which is fish. No, Pisces is fish, sorry. <coughs> Aquarius is water or something, right? What else is there? Aap kya? Capricorn. What is Capricorn? I forgot. I think it's a mountain water. okay. I've, I've forgotten. So who created all this stuff? Who? You had the answer before. No, no, no. No, it's the same answer as the one before. Babylonians. Yes! <laughs> it's the Babylonians. Oh my God, if I you know, tell you how many things they've screwed up for us, <laughs> you would want to kill them. It's the Babylonians. They looked up at the sky and they said, you know what, that looks like a bear, that looks like a goat, that looks like a woman, that looks like a falana, and they named them. And the names they gave them, we get today. And not only did they give them names, the way these things moved in the sky according to the seasons, etc., they made up stories about them. They said, Ahmed, because you were born in this time of the month, that time of the month belongs to cancer. Cancer is a crab. I have a crab. It bit me over here. It's crabby. That's why you're crabby. You have that personality. And till today, 4,000 years later, Emmett picks up his smartphone. And where does he go? To the daily horoscope to look at how his day is going to be. Yeah, it's Babylonian. It's all Babylonian. Um, Maybe. Maybe they predicted the end of the world. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but the point is that, what was the point? <laughs> I lost the point. Oh, yes, the point was that these were the major discoveries that went across Europe like a tidal wave. And the result of, of them was not only the Enlightenment, but also the French Revolution. And then the ideas of people like Hobbes, and Rousseau, and John Locke, uh, and uh, Machiavelli, and others were an equal tidal wave in the world of politics. 
And so this is a revolutionary era where they believe that on the foundation of science and rationality, they're going to build it up the egal an egalitarian society. So that's what's going on. Okay. All right, where were we? Yes, skipping from the Enlightenment, only 300 years forward, uh, we come to the, the World War II. So after World War II, the, the Nazis are defeated. 50 million people lie in their graves. Millions of other people's homes are destroyed. Mm, hundreds of thousands of people now live across Europe, some without arms, some without legs, bearing the wounds of, of the largest war that history has ever seen. Um, a new society, uh, uh, there is also a new pledge across Europe that we're going to try and never have this again. We had two of these massive wars and the results have been catastrophic and we want to make a new society that is never going to have this again. Europe should never have a world war. It should never have a genocide. It should never have a situation where millions of people are pushed into camps where they are gassed to death. That should never happen. And that resolve is very, very strong. And there is a deep search for answers of why this happened and what can be done to avoid it. And one of the answers, not the only answer, there are many different answers. Of course, this leads to the creation, the very creation on the one hand of the United Nations. On the other hand, under the United Nations, it leads to the creation of things like the International Labour Organization. It leads to the creation of uh, uh, the Bretton Woods system uh, so that there would never be again an economic crisis of the kind that occurred after 1928 that could possibly lead to fascism. So there's the creation of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, which later becomes the World Bank. And there is the creation of the International Monetary Fund that would give certain short-term credit to governments so that governments would not completely collapse leading to the rise of fascism as they believe occurred in 1920s in Italy and Germany. So it's really to stop fascism from rising again that these various institutions are built. And uh, uh, so th that's the sort of, you could say, the liberal uh, liberals and others, the, 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 or, or rather, that's not even so, so good actually. Uh, the winners of World War II create th these institutions, which includes the Soviet Union, it includes um, the United States, United Kingdom, and so on. And, uh, but there is also a search in academia and other places. And one of the answers, one of the important answers uh, that academia begins to give is that the reason why fascism arose is because of rational, instrumental thinking. This calculus, this cold-hearted calculus that we make, uh, you know, in this one column we will write all the things that are, are ben co costs and this other column, we're going to write all the things that are benefits. And then we're going to make this cold, hard calculation. Of, this kind of thinking stops us from being human. It treats people as objects. And we've got to stop doing that. And so uh, the French intellectual scene, now by the 1960s, the French intellectual scene from the 1930s till the 1960s is completely dominated by Marxism, first of all. Okay, all the big French names from the 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. They're all raving Marxists, Leninists, Communists, whatever, Bolsheviks, etc., etc. But then, by the late 19, mid and late 1960s, a transformation comes over France, and people move from Karl Marx to Friedrich Nietzsche, and this Wolin calls a momentous shift in French intellectual life. Why does this shift occur? This shift from, Nietzsche, from Marx to Nietzsche, uh, from Marx to uh, Heidegger and so on. They are reading Heidegger, they are reading Nietzsche, they are reading the German intellectuals and they're saying, you know what? I think these guys are onto something and we need to take them seriously. Despite the fact that they were German and we don't like Germans very much, say the French, uh, nothing personal Sven, <laughs> but these guys have something of value to contribute. We should understand them and so on. So what is it that causes this shift? According to Wolin, there are a number of things. First of all, is the fall of France, by which he means the fall of the French Empire. From all, France is no namby-pamby little state of liberty, equality, fraternity. That was a long time ago. After liberty, equality, and fraternity, 
comes the era of empire and colonialism. All of North and Western Africa comes under French colonial rule. The French East India Company goes around the Horn of Africa, all the way to the east, and sets up <coughs> trading centers in what is today Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, China, uh, you know, uh, uh, East Asia, all over East Asia, and take over those countries, take over East Asian countries. They are even in parts of India and so on. So they're a major, major colonial power. How do they emerge as a colonial power? Mainly as a consequence of the French Revolution. The state is reorganized, it's much more efficient, it's much better, it's able to not dominate over many others. Then they create a little canal through the middle, because first they had to go all the way around Africa, now they can go straight through the Mediterranean, across into the Indian Ocean, and from there into. So they have these massive colonies. And in these colonies, unlike the British, who always thought that you people were natives and that was good enough, and you could learn the English language and so on and so forth, and that was good enough. And then maybe at some future point in time, you'd be quote unquote, civilized enough for self-rule. The French thought of their French colonies as sort of part of France. The British didn't think of India as part of India, but the French thought of North Africa as being part of greater France. Hi, how are you? <laughs> want a cup of coffee? <laughs> you, want, you can go get one if you like. I say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, such an important, precious thing these days. Disturbed him. Sorry, yaar. Um, where was I? So the, when the French lost the French colonies, and some of the big battles that took place are the, the battle in Algeria, is one of the big battles that was occurring at the time from the 50s onwards. Sartre writes about it. Uh, Wretched of the Earth by, uh, whatchamacallim, uh, France Fanon becomes a, a big thing across the third world as well as in France. The Vietnamese are fighting the French and they are damn good at fighting, I can tell you that. Ho Chi Minh goes from village to village on his little khoti and starts organizing people and they come out of the bloody woodworks, they come out of the rice paddies and they're now fighting the French. And in 1954, at the famous battle of Dien Bien Phu, they inflict on the French this crushing defeat. These peasants who don't even have sandals, barefoot, they come, they fight the French Empire and defeat it. So the French, first of all, are feeling this enormous lack of self-confidence, this complete destruction of the old France is occurring. Uh, then there is the problem of occupation and collaboration. Uh, that the may, many parts of many French people themselves collaborated with the Nazis. How do we deal with that? The uncertainties of the Cold War, the possibility of nuclear annihilation, there's the Soviet Union and there's uh, America and they both have bombs that can destroy the entire globe. Good God. Uh, they are defeated in Indochina, that's Vietnam, they are defeated in Algeria. At the same time, France is going through rapid urbanization. There's a rise of mass culture and suddenly there are universities in France that are now mass universities. Before World War II, uh, universities were very, very tiny elitist affairs. Only the landed class went to universities. Okay, it was a tiny, tiny minority of people that went to universities. One percent. And now universities are open to the, to, to the population, people from poorer countries, middle class backgrounds, they're in universities. As soon as they get into universities, what do they start doing? Politics. They want power, people's power, student politics. There's the invasion of Hungary in 1956, which leads in, in France to a very strong reaction to communism, because they don't like the invasion. There's the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, that and the invasion of Afghanistan, these things build anti-communism and so a movement away, a, a movement of the intelligentsia away from Marxism which is associated with the Soviet Union. Also, there's slowly a movement against third world national liberation movements, the cultural revolution of Mao Zedong, Castro's Cuba, Idi Amin's Uganda, Mobutu Zaire, Duvalier in Haiti, Vagara. This stuff results in the French intelligentsia saying, Actually, we don't really want any of this either. It's far too much like what we are trying to get away from. Um, and there are new intellectual currents, Solzhenitsyn, Havel, and so many others, the new philosophers uh, from the mid-1970s, etc., etc. Uh, finally, 
by the late 1960s, a significant part of the French intelligentsia thinks of capitalism as communis and communism as two sides of the same coin. They think neither the US nor the Soviet Union, they are pretty much the same. We don't want any of this. So they begin to try and create a new idea. What is that new idea? Oh yes, and the most important event arguably is the defeat of the student movement in 1968. You must have heard of this movement, right? Where the students got together and they said, we are gonna make a revolution in France. Look at that, that's really quite fascinating. That is, the, that is a picture, a rooftop view of the March of May 1968. And those are the students occupying Paris. And you can see how massive it is. Uh, that shows you this was not some affair in which people said, we don't want to eat at the PDC. This was a national level movement. Um, but sadly, nothing really came of it. I mean, OK, that's a bit unfair. Um, it wasn't able to change government as such. It was able to change, it was able to create certain new laws, certain new liberties, new labor laws were passed which were very progressive. Most of the welfare state labor laws were created at this time. The Communist Party of France, which had about a third of the seats in the National Assembly, was a very powerful party, very highly respected party. They used to call it the party of the 70, 77,000 martyrs because they had 77,000 martyrs in the fight against fascism. Um, negotiated with the government and got this massive sort of contract and so on and so forth. So yeah, all of that were, were changes. But you have to understand that the 68 movement aspired to something much grander and greater. It wanted to change the world. It was going to be free love. There was going to be an end to, the, to patriarchy. There was going to be an end to exploitation. There was going to be an end to everything bad that was, going, that was happening. And that didn't really happen. And so, Terry Eagleton writes that post-structuralism was a product of that blend of euphoria and disillusionment, uh, liberation and dissipation, carnival and catastrophe, which was 1968. Unable to break the structures of state power, post-structuralism found it possible instead to subvert the structures of language. The freedom of the text or language would come to compensate for the unfreedom of the system as a whole. Had 68 won, he's saying, post-structuralism would not have come about. But it did, precisely because of the hopes that 68 raised in France and could not then meet at the same time. So now we get postmodernism. Nietzsche and Heidegger become the intellectual icons of post-war France. They influence people like Jack Derrida, Michel Foucault, Deleuze, uh, Althusser, Lacan, and the ideas of the Enlightenment are now being considered in French intellectual life as a bad, bad joke with a horrible aftertaste. The Enlightenment assumption that truth and power are opposed to one another is illusionary. You know, sort of slogans of the Enlightenment is, truth shall win against power. I shall speak truth to power, right? That's a really central Enlightenment slogan, right? I am going to represent objectivity. You are the subjectivist. I represent the truth. It's not going to be that way, say the French intellectuals. Truth is instead merely a disguised emissary of power. Ooh. What you think is the truth is actually also a play of power. At the precise moment Nietzsche had become persona non grata in his native Germany, he was anointed and apostatized by French post-structuralism. Germany lost on the battlefield, but it triumphed in the seminar rooms. That was your quiz. It was the answer, right? So French intellectuals moved away from Marx and adopted uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger. And the marriage of Nietzsche and Heidegger to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the aspirations of the May 1968 movement gives you postmodernism and post-structuralism. Uh, we have people like Claude Levi Strauss, uh, 20th century horrors. He says, such as total war, genocide, colonialism, nuclear annihilation, were the result, he says, of Western humanism. Although Strauss, Levi Strauss is basically a structuralist. Structuralist does not mean 
somebody who believes in the structures of a society. That's the wrong understanding. That's, that was my understanding before I read structuralism when I was an undergrad student. Structuralism is referring to language, the structures of language. But you can see in terms of structuralism's critique of the modern world is very similar to post-structuralism. All the tragedies we have lived through, first with colonialism, then with fascism, finally the concentration camps, all this has taken shape, not in opposition or in contradiction with so-called humanism, but I would say almost as its natural continuation. Humanism has resulted in fascism. <clears throat> You don't think so. It's a big idea. It's a big idea. Science, objectivity, rationalism, humanism, all this has led to the horrors of the 20th century. You can see the link to the counter enlightenment, correct? The commonality. There are dissimilarities as well, but there you can see a similarity. Then you get this crazy fella. Look at him. He's mad as a hatter. He doesn't have a hat though. Didn't need one, he had it in. Power knowledge is Foucault, that was just a joke, okay. Foucault doesn't mind, he liked jokes. Uh, power knowledge becomes Foucault's battle cry. He praised the sovereign enterprise of, not reason, but unreason. Power is everywhere. To contest it almost seems, no, is in fact pointless. You cannot get away from power, no matter what you do. In the history of sexual, in the history of sexuality, he talks about the different economies of bodies and pleasures. He talks about the, the, the what's the right word, the uh, 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 kya kehte usko? The, the rationing of pleasure as a means of discipline. Like you ration goods, you can also ration happiness, he says. The, we the West suffered from a hypertrophy of the intellect by emphatically opting for the values of instrumental rationalism. Somebody's going to teach you that later. Instrumental <laughs> rationalism. <laughs> Listen, just because I'm teaching this stuff doesn't mean I agree with it, okay? I'm only teaching you this stuff because it's important to learn it. And whatever I teach, at the moment that I teach it, I believe it 100%. But then I come to my senses, okay? <laughs> the point is that uh, it doesn't matter what I believe, okay? But you have to understand the argument. So he thought instrumental rationalism is the hypertrophy of the intellect and it has systematically precluded other more distinguished value options. We have shunned aside other ways of looking at the world, other values for this dispassionate, cold, rationalist, scientific, objectivist interpretation, which is just another power play. For Foucault, Foucault's, for Foucault, sorry about that error, Nietzsche's virtue was to have turned the acid bath of criticism against reason itself. Nietzsche turned reason against reason. Like, uh, that reminds me of uh, Al-Ghazali, who turned the Mutazilite arguments against the Mutazilites. So he turns reasons, reason against reason, Reason was constitutionally opposed to all metaphysical dogma and fixed ideas. Ironically though, one in unexamined, a unexamined dogma yet remained reason itself. Reason is saying, I'm going to fight all dogmas. I'm going to fight all dogmas. We have to get rid of dogmas. Critical thinking, critical thinking, blah, 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 scientific objectivity, yeah, blah, blah, blah. blah. Well, you never turned that scientific, critical thinking, reason, reason uh, you know, rationality against the concept of reason itself. Is it even possible? Reason remained convinced of its own impartiality, whereas all competing, sorry, that's another error, competing claims to truth were allegedly tainted by interest, vested interests and so on. But reason was above all these things, so reason claimed. Reason willfully concealed its own intrinsic prejudices and partisanship. Reason is not unpartisan. Truth is a thing of this world, proclaims Foucault in Truth and Power, as a system of ordered procedures for the production, regulation, distribution, circulation and operation of statements. There is no tr truth in that sense. It is, its purpose is what? Uh, to regulate thought 
As such, truth is linked in a circular relation with systems of power which produce and sustain it, and to effects of power which it induces and which extends it. The historical analysis of this rancorous will to knowledge reveals that all knowledge rests upon injustice, not justice. That there is no right, not even the, in the act of knowing, to truth or a foundation for truth. And that the instinct for knowledge is malicious, something murderous, opposed to the happiness of mankind. You, my friend, what's your name? Sorry? Moid, you are the only good guy in this classroom. Everybody else is aspiring towards this murderous, uh, malicious instinct for knowledge. They're pretending like they're really gaining knowledge. But you, my friend, are beyond and above all of that. And you're like, I already know this is all a bunch of lies anyway. You know, it's all there to make Temur Rahman or people like him, you know, uh, seem more authoritative. So there's no truth, says Foucault. And from rational, Wolin says, but if you accept that there's no truth, then what becomes the basis of accepting an argument? It's your word against mine, and there is no objective truth to say what is, there is no objectivity to determine what is correct or incorrect, then how do we determine what is correct? Well, we have to take recourse to, according to Wolin, to authority, who is saying it? And I think Foucault is quite you know, I mean, I think is, there's something to be said when Foucault says it's not just what is being said, but you must always examine who is saying it and what do they get out of saying it? How do they benefit out of saying it, right? So if I tell you that I am a PhD and you must listen to me, I benefit out of that. I gain power over you. That knowledge gives me power. And the knowledge, when you accept that what I know is knowledge, that gives me more power. Right? So, knowledge power is the same thing for Foucault. So, if, if that is the thing, then Foucault ra raises the question that you must always ask, who and why? What do they get it, out of it? Um, but, Wolin says, once we have discovered who is speaking and why they are speaking, we have as yet said nothing about the propositional content of the utterance or assertion in question. So it may be that who is speaking is a bad guy, and what he is saying is in his favor, but he may still be right or wrong. We don't know. Just because we know who is saying it and what they get or don't get out of it doesn't mean that what they are saying is right, correct, or incorrect. Of course, Foucault would not accept that at all, because he'd say this correct and incorrect jargon is itself the jargon that we get from this rationalist sort of stuff. But Wolin is not having that. Uh, Ferry and Renaud say, for example, the hatred of argumentation means principally the return of authority. For example, Foucault embraced the Iranian revolution as it was anti-modern, anti-Western, and anti-liberal. He liked the fact that it was anti-modern, anti-liberal, and anti-Western. He liked it. He said, yeah, this is different. I want to support it. Why is that ironic? What's wrong with it? What's wrong if he supported the Iranian revolution? You may ask, yes. That could be one line of argument, but Foucault never thought of it advocating an absolute truth. He no, neither did he say they claimed that they were advocating an absolute truth. Foucault didn't accept that claim, but he did accept it is a truth, a perspective, an Iranian one, etc. So I don't think you can put that down to internal contradiction. I think you can, you can say, however, that Foucault himself is, could not have survived three days in the, under the Iranian regime because he was gay. He, you know, he, or, or heterosexual, uh, well, not hetero, but what, what do you call it? He was, what, bisexual. yes, thank you. Well, I don't even know if bi is the right word anymore because so he was gender fluid, so you know. He, whatever, not transsexual because that's something different. But he was like, didn't care about sex, he didn't care about, yeah, he didn't care about, um, yes, thank you. He didn't think that putting sexuality in these categories of hetero and homosexual and this and that, etc., was useful in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and he was deeply anti-authoritarian. He was always challenging the government and so on and so forth. He couldn't have survived three days in that regime. There's no doubt about that. But here's the more interesting thing. What does he say about the Iranian revolution? They, the Iranians, 
Muslims, don't have the same regime of truth as ours. I don't know if you find that offensive or not. But you have a different regime of truth than the Europeans. Which it has to be said, has to be said is very special. Even if it has become almost universal. The Greeks had their own. The Arabs of the Maghrib have another. And in Iran, it is largely modeled on a religion that has an ex exoteric form and an esoteric content. That is to say, everything that is said under the explicit form of the law also refers to another meaning. So not only is saying one thing that means another not a condemnable ambiguity, it is, on the contrary, a necessary and highly prized additional value level of meaning. What does that mean? That means Iranians, whatever they say, everything has double meaning. Everything they say has two meanings. And this is a good thing. It's ambiguous what it is that they're saying. Um, it is often the case that people say something that at the factual level isn't true, but which refers to another deeper meaning which cannot be assimilated in terms of precision and observation. They are beyond science, says Foucault, the Iranians. They are ambiguous in a, such an interesting way that you can't categorize them in the way you would under the Western metaphysical system. Then comes Derrida. Um, reason is essentially a mechanism of oppression. Textual coherence is a chimera. The center does not hold. There is no epistemological finality or closure. Uh, structuralism is logocentric. He is, of course, deeply influenced by Heidegger. You can read these statements and you can understand what they mean. There's no truth. Oh my God, it's all, I'm almost running out of time. But, since we're doing postmodernism today, and since phen phenomenologically you haven't experienced time as one hour, 50 minutes, uh, we're not really sure whether we're running out of time or not. Because there's no. Objectivist. There is no, your reason is essentially a mechanism of oppression. And there is no, okay, forget it. There is no epistemological finality on the fact that we have run out of time. Um, humanism culminates in the will only to will. It results in genocide, totalitarianism, nuclear annihilation, environmental catastrophe. This is the result of humanism. Everything is the text. It trivializes, but Wolin says, does it not trivialize mass murder, uh, to see mass murder only as text? These are people's lives being destroyed. The gas chambers, sorry, it's not actually, it's Professor Evans, Richard Evans. The gas chambers were not written only a piece of rhetoric. Two slides left, huh? I, I ask you for a little more time. Lyotard says, reason is consensus with terror. Gadamer, enlightenment ideals were bankrupt. Leading representatives of hermeneutics, all truth claims are situated, partial, contextual. And finally, Yale becomes the Vatican of postmodernism, where uh, Wolin says counter enlightenment arguments have attained a new lease of life amongst the cultural left. What were earlier right wing arguments have today become left wing arguments. How's that, baby? That's called a googly. In fact, it's, what's the googly, which is the googly on the googly? So, huh? Dusra. It's a dusra. Yes, that's a nice. All the girls are like, or, and the non-cricketers are like, what is that? There's a googly, and then there's a, uh, there's a way that you do the googly that it actually doesn't do a leg spin, but it does, it does what, an off spin or something, right? Oh, no, it's like, it's an off spinner uses it to bowl a leg spin ball. All right, okay. What's it when a leg spinner bowls an off spin ball? Oh, that's the googly, sorry, okay. So, whatever it is, anyway, the point is, it's confusing. Um, where was I? The, wor the world is a socially constructed text. Human rights related to the were, are basically a product of Western humanism. We must embrace cultural relativism. Reason is a source of tyranny and oppression. Discourse is a source of domination. Uh, now we are in the period of postmodern scandals. Because suddenly, from, uh, in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, it became disclosed that some of the big postmodern writers many of them at Yale, turned out were fascists, writing for fascists when they were kids, when they were college students and in their 20s. Maurice Blanchot wrote for the pro-fascist and anti-Semitic journal Combat, 
Paul Diman, was a, he was a guru of deconstructionism, wrote over 200 articles for the Nazis. These were then, you know, people rediscovered these articles because they had been lost. They were in archives and so on and so forth. The archives were unearthed, they were republished. People were shocked. But Derrida said, no, no, he was just subverting Nazism from within. Heidegger, the true ex everybody knew that Heidegger was involved with Nazism, but the true extent of his involvement with Nazism became public knowledge only in the late 19 in the English speaking world only in the late 1980s when there was this really very good book that was published with a lot of detail about you know what his involvements were uh, were postmodernist arguments prefigured by fascists what then becomes the politics of postmodernism for derrida it is difference for foucault it is transgression for deleuze and guattari it is schizophrenia Political economy, of course, plays no role in this analysis because they've all said that's all, you know, rational, instrumental sort of thinking. But can this lead to a narcissist lifestyle politics, a new essentialism in which group identity or individual identity is elevated to the first principle? Is identity an argument? Postmodernism uh, relieves me of the obligation to be right, says Professor Fish and demands only that I be interesting. Disease of non-judgmentalism, says Wolin, leads to the paralysis of reason. Would that be so wrong? To end, what is the lesson that we can take from this? Well, the lesson that I don't want you to take is XYZ was fascist or not fascist, ABC was a horrible fellow or not a horrible fellow. The lesson I want you to take from this is how Ideas are like streams of water, colored water, that are constantly mixing and synthesizing with each other in ways in which sometimes political movements are not. But ideas travel across political movements from the right to the left, from the left to the right, from the center outwards and from the outwards into the center and all sorts of other ways, interesting ways. And it is very possible that one can be, Wolin says, both a towering writer, a great intellectual, a great scholar, a great philosopher, a great thinker, and yet be politically a horrible person, or a personally horrible person, right? These things are possible. We always seem to think that a man of great eloquence or a woman of great eloquence must be a great man or woman, but that's not necessarily the case. This lesson challenges our customary notion of intellectual greatness, which makes it all the more worth contemplating. Um, that's Wolin's lesson. But my, my take from it is that I would, what I like you to take from it is not just this, which is very important, but also to see the complex, interesting, nuanced way in which ideas can intermingle, creating new synthesis, new combinations uh, on all sides of the political spectrum. And we must be able to, perhaps at some level, not just trace where various ideas come from, that's one thing, but also see the impact of how these ideas combine in what the results of those particular combinations are or are not. Thank you, that's all for today. <laughs>